Greetings. I am Shanta Bahan, the Associate for Mission and Outreach at St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church in Dallas, Texas. Thank you for joining us for a new installation of My Story, in which we will learn about the Grimke Sisters. My Story is a series that invites us to learn about individuals who have contributed to historical social justice issues that impact our lives today. As you can see behind me, there are a series of images, our icons of the saints. This visual representation of the saints is how we remember their holy work as we enter into a life of prayer and deeper devotion to God. These biographical stories of historical figures, including the Grimkes, Verna Dozier, William Stringfellow, William Wilberforce, and others, serve as aniconic representations of good people who sought to do the will of God despite the opposition. This holy work, the response to Micah 6, 8, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, impacts our life today. We will explore four questions. Who are Sarah and Angelina Grimke? What did they do? Why was this important? And why is this relevant for us today? Sarah and Angelina Grimke's work was buried for decades in history until it was revived in the 1960s when the second wave of feminism identified issues of discrimination and the way that women's personal lives reflected unjust power structures in society. In 2014, we see their names again when Sue Monk Kidd published The Invention of Wings, a novel about Sarah Grimke and her slave. Essentially, the subjugation of women to men reflected the subjugation of slaves to slave owners. For the Grimke sisters, abolition and women's rights were very closely linked together. The Grimke family had origins in the Protestant Huguenot community that faced persecution by the French Catholic community. This Protestant Huguenot community emigrated from France to the Americas in the 17th century to practice their Protestant faith freely. Sarah and Angelina Grimke were reared in Charleston, South Carolina. The family was a part of Charleston's aristocracy, and Charleston, South Carolina was the wealthiest area among the colonies. John Grimke, Sarah and Angelina's father, served as a judge, a member of the legislature, and as mayor in South Carolina. He wielded both political power and economic power. John Grimke was a wealthy plantation owner who, like his neighbors, used slave labor to maintain his family's affluent lifestyle. No one in the household needed to do anything for themselves. Each person had a personal slave. During the day, the adult slaves tended to the family's every need. Overnight, slave children remained awake to tend to the needs that the Grimke family members might have. Some historians say that Sarah and Angelina developed their strong anti-slavery sentiments because her father would often discipline his children by requiring them to work in the fields alongside slaves. They learned firsthand what the backbreaking work and inhumane conditions were. At the age of five, Sarah witnessed abusive treatment of a slave and she tried to leave home. Angelina also became disillusioned with her family's treatment of slaves. On one occasion, she challenged her mother over her brother's cruel treatment of his slave. She believed that slavery was a grave sin and that mortal danger would fall upon those who perpetuated slavery. Sarah, born in 1872, was 12 years older than Angelina, who was born in 1805. They were among 14 children, three of whom died. Though neither was allowed the same education that their brothers received, they had access to a vast family library, and their brothers are known to have helped them study Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, in addition to other subjects for which the male children had private tutors. Perhaps because she was exposed to her father's work as judge, Sarah showed great potential as a lawyer. Unfortunately, she was not allowed to attend law school, as her brother did, because the culture did not approve of women's higher education. These early experiences of antipathy towards slavery and limitation on women's rights led Sarah to leave her home and move to Philadelphia in 1821, where she became acquainted with the Society of Friends and became a Quaker. In 1829, Angelina, completely disenchanted with slavery, also moved to Philadelphia, joining her sister to become a Quaker. Angelina took the lead in the abolitionist movement in Philadelphia. In 1836, 
Angelina wrote her appeal to the Christian women of the South, encouraging white Southern women to embrace the anti-slavery stance. She wrote, I know you do not make the laws, but I also know that you are the wives and mothers, the sisters and daughters of those who do. And if you really suppose you can do nothing to overthrow slavery, you are greatly mistaken. Many Southerners opposed her abolitionist message and many Northerners felt that women ought not to be writing or speaking about controversial issues like slavery. In response to the opposition from the North and South, Sarah wrote letters on the equality of the sexes. By the late 1830s, the Grimke sisters were known not only as abolitionists, but also as proponents of women's rights. The two issues were now closely intertwined. The Grimke sisters sought to address both. From 1837 to 1845, the Grimke sisters led the way for women to become involved with politics, even though they were not yet allowed to vote. How did they do this? Their own experience as women from a wealthy Southern slaveholding family who grew to despise the evil of slavery was a compelling narrative that drew male and female audiences at a time when women were rarely allowed to speak in public and cultural taboos forbade women from speaking to mixed gender audiences. Women like the Grimkes perfected the art of the petition during this era. A biblical reference that might be familiar is 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. The petition was a prayerful and respectful way of making a request. These were prayers with sincere argument against slavery or the death penalty or alcohol. And women supported these petitions by collecting signatures. These were the political version of collective prayers that were intended to be transformational for culture and society. Women who signed these petitions hoped that they could initiate new laws and policies as these documents were sent to Congress or to state legislatures. The Grimkes soon traveled to New York and Massachusetts where their audiences swelled. In Massachusetts, they gathered 325 to 1800 women at each gathering across at least five cities. Women signed petitions at these events and the number of anti-slavery societies across Massachusetts nearly doubled and 80% of signatures on petitions from Massachusetts to Congress were women signatures. The historical impact of the Grimke sisters' anti-slavery and women's suffrage work extends far beyond this brief summary. What we learn from them is that women created a new political role for themselves in a society that did not allow them to vote, limited their formal political roles, and discouraged them from speaking and writing to a mixed gendered audience. Despite these challenges, the Grimke sisters and the women around them became vocal advocates for justice and equality. Women located their power and the power of their masses to create a unique and influential political sphere in which they improved their own lives and the lives of others with less power. Sarah and Angelina Grimke encourage us to look at the injustice in the lives of others around us and to think more deeply about what power we have to act on behalf of others. What are some of the injustices we see in our world today? I'm reminded of human trafficking in our area and around the world. How can we partner with those who are su supporting survivors and remediating perpetrators? Can we advocate for a living wage? Do we seek to provide for the needs of others in practical ways? What is the power that we have when we think we lack the power to make changes in our society? Many of us are already working on behalf of others. Perhaps our first step is a petition, a prayer to God for wisdom. Our next step might be prayer for courage to take the step that God reveals to us. After that, we might encourage family, friends, and neighbors to join with us in a practical deed of justice and mercy. Whatever we're called to do, let us ask for eyes of faith to see beyond the limitation and to the possibilities that are open to us as we seek to do God's will in the world as agents of justice and peace.